It was already written in the stars that this crooner would make his mark in the world of music. He would gravitate to one style in particular, confusing many around him, but he ignored the naysayers and carried on. Then, after several years of superstar collabs, chart-topping hits, and award nominations, everything fell apart, leaving him alone to pick up the pieces. Let's find out what happened to American R&B singer-songwriter and record producer John B. Jonathan David Buck, known professionally as John B., was born in Providence, Rhode Island, and raised in Altadena, California. He comes from a very musical family. His father was a professor of music, and his mother was a concert pianist. John also has two siblings, a brother who's a cellist, and a sister who's a violinist. His grandparents even owned a record store. John picked up his first instrument, the keyboard, when he was eight years old. Soon after, he also began playing guitar and the drums. Naturally, his parents played a major role in helping John get his start in music education. His mother was the first person to sit him down and try to teach him to read music. However, John felt much more comfortable learning by ear. Even though both of his parents were heavily into the classical genre, John developed a love for rock and especially R&B, with some of his early musical influences being Duran Duran, The Bee Gees, Earth, Wind & Fire, Sade, and Michael Jackson. John was clearly about his musical business at a very young age. He began recording and distributing his own music at 10. He became a child entrepreneur by making tapes and selling them to his friends at school for $5. He officially decided that music would be his life's work when he won his eighth grade talent show. Interestingly enough, the judges that day were members of the Pasadena-based R&B group, Troub, who John would go on to become good friends with in the future. John got a chance to really hone his singing skills at his performing arts high school. There, he would join the gospel choir and learn how to properly sing, as he was taught by a woman who just happened to be a former member of popular 60s group, The Fifth Dimension. By the time his last year of high school came around, it was clear that John didn't really have any other choice whether or not to pursue music professionally. He pretty much had to, since his grades were not gonna be the thing to help him go far in life. So he took full advantage of being able to sign himself out during the school day and use the free time to camp out in the lobby of various record labels, demo in hand, waiting to catch someone on their lunch break. One day, he made his way over to Yab Yum Records. Since it was a small label and no one was really around to engage with, John just dropped off his demo and left. Little did he know that it would soon catch the attention of the president and CEO, Tracy Edmonds, wife of legendary singer-songwriter and record producer, Kenneth Babyface Edmonds. As John continued making the rounds to other labels, he would end up securing a meeting with Motown. While in their office, a call came in. It was Babyface. He heard John's demo and wanted him to come over immediately. In 1993, at the age of 19, John became the first artist signed to Yab Yum Records. Initially, John got his feet wet by joining Babyface's band playing the keyboards. He would then go on to write and produce for numerous artists, such as New Edition, Tony Braxton, Color Me Bad, and After Seven. Playing these behind the scenes roles were actually what John preferred. The main purpose of his demo tape was to showcase his writing and production skills, not necessarily his singing ability. It wasn't until Babyface himself told John that he had all the makings of a great recording artist that he decided to go for it. Two years later, his debut album titled Bonafide was released and went on to achieve platinum status. It spawned the top 10 hit, Someone to Love, featuring Babyface. The song was also nominated for a Grammy Award and was featured on the soundtrack for the 1995 cop action comedy film, Bad Boys. Then came the time for John to spread his wings and show the world that there was much more to his musical style than just sounding like the white babyface. His second album titled Cool Relax dropped in 1997. The single, They Don't Know, became not only another top 10 song, but his biggest hit ever. Two other singles, Don't Say and Are You Still Down, featuring Tupac Shakur, 
also helped the album become certified double platinum. Years later, John would speak fondly of how the latter song came together. He got an invite to the studio that Tupac was recording in one day. As it turned out, Tupac was a fan, so much so that John would even catch a glimpse of his CD inside Tupac's car. They hung out, John played some beats while Tupac freestyled over them, and they both agreed that a collaboration was inevitable. A couple of weeks later, it happened. After John turned the song into the label, however, he was told that it wouldn't see the light of day. The issue was over John and Tupac being extremely different artists from one another, and there was a major concern especially about Tupac's thug life image having a negative impact on John's clean-cut lover boy image. Sadly, just two weeks after recording the song, Tupac would become a fatal victim of a drive-by shooting in Las Vegas on September 13th, 1996. Now, John felt it was only right to shelve the track until he spoke to Tupac's mother, Afini Shakur. John went to her home and she told him how her son never played her any of his music because he didn't want to offend her with the subject matter. He did, however, and was proud to play her Are You Still Down? John made it a point on his sophomore effort to showcase more of his true self. From the beginning, his label never made any attempts to conceal his race. They knew the music and his songwriting talent would win out in the end. Nevertheless, he did have people talking about how he frequently showcased black women in his music videos. His significant other in his life at the time was also black. That's real to the way I'm living. The woman I can relate to right now is a black woman. While on tour promoting Cool Relax, John developed an amazing chemistry with his backup singers, and they began writing together. Before he knew it, they ended up with about five or six songs. So he decided that the three of them should form a super group called Jack Herrera and try to put out an album. John was very proud of the work they did, but his label was not at all interested. Pleasures You Like, John's third studio album was released in March 2001. Despite this being his third album in a row to go platinum, John felt it was not marketed and promoted properly. He was also dealing with major creative differences with the label. Only one song was released called Don't Talk. Furthermore, there was a lot of merging and rearranging going on at many of the major labels, and John found that most of the people who played an integral role in putting together his previous albums were being pushed out. As a result, he felt it was best that he part ways with Yabyum. Unfortunately, more disappointment was on the horizon for John. His short-lived marriage came to an end, and a terrible fire in his recording studio ruined all of his equipment and catalog of material dating back to his teens. As anyone could imagine, this was a devastating blow for John. To cope, he began drinking and smoking excessively and sunk into a depression. One bright light in his life was all the support he got from his longtime friend, Danette. Eventually, they would take their relationship to the next level and become husband and wife. Now, ready to get back on the horse, John made a move to work with Matthew Knowles, the father of superstar entertainer Beyonce, by signing on with Sanctuary Records. Matthew had just been hired as the president of Urban Music at the label. John's fourth album, appropriately titled Stronger Every Day, was released in October 2004. The album didn't do anywhere near as well as his other efforts, even though John considered it his best work to date. He would later attribute the failure to a lack of support from the label. The word on the street too was that many of Matthew's artists were struggling because he had severely tarnished his relationships with people in the industry. At one point, radio even refused to play any of his artists' music. During this time, another R&B artist of the Caucasian persuasion was making his debut and putting his stamp on the genre by the name of Robin Thicke. Unsurprisingly, it was becoming impossible for John to escape the comparisons and dealing with Robin's name constantly being brought into every conversation. John would later admit that he did feel threatened watching Robin come on the scene and ascend in the blue-eyed soul arena that he'd always dominated. Over the next decade, John would continue to release several projects independently, including his first Christmas album, as well as an album featuring previously unreleased songs. Then, John would take a significant hiatus. He would sum up what he was up to during that time in a 2019 interview with ParleyMag.com. Constant touring and spending time with the family. 
The most important thing for me right now is to make the best decisions in business and personally, and that's what this time has allowed me. There was a brief moment in 2016 where it looked like an album was on the way, but nothing ever materialized. John had signed a deal with well-known music producer Warren Campbell to his boutique indie label, My Block Inc. A full album was made, but as Warren alluded to in later interviews, things didn't end up panning out due to business disagreements. In 2019, John dropped his first single in seven years called Understand, featuring R&B singer Donnell Jones. As he made the rounds to promote it, he also revealed that a brand new album of the same name was on the way. He also released another single that year in anticipation of the album called Priceless. At the beginning of the 2020 quarantine, John created the Vibe Select Cafe, named after his production company, a weekly Instagram Live concert experience aimed to lift the spirits of his fans stuck at home. He also relished being able to be home for an extended period of time with his wife of nearly 15 years and their two daughters. As things have slowly gotten back to normal in 2021, John's return to touring and connecting with fans face to face. His album that was anticipated to come out in early 2020 still doesn't have an official release date as of the making of this video. In a 2019 interview with thehypemagazine.com, he did though have this to say about what fans could expect. The album is gonna be a return to just romantic vibes. One thing I can definitely say is I'm in touch with that romantic side of myself. It's strictly for the lovers out there. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and comment. Also, don't forget to subscribe and turn on your notifications so you won't miss any future videos. See you next time.